Hi there, everybody. My name is Peter Marshall. Welcome to my living room. Uh, in this talk entitled Optimize Your Segments, we're going to share some tips and tricks out of um, our community team here and other experts at Imply with those of you who may just be starting out with using Druid. We're going to look at Druid's automated optimization techniques for, Druid, for its data and also some techniques that you can apply yourself. Now, it's important to know these as you go on to operate Druid because segments are the building block for parallelism and for throughput. And as a developer, we're going to cover some really important techniques to consider using when ingesting data to help Druid answer queries quickly. But let's start by putting segment optimization into the context of parallelism. The ingestion tasks in Druid create shards of data that Druid can store, and we call those segments. These, this partitioning of these segments is controlled by, in your insert statement, the clustered by and partitioned by parts of your query. In ingestion specifications that are using the JSON ingestion specification, it's the segment granularity and particular settings in your partition spec. Segments are referenced in the metadata database, and they live inside the deep storage of your cluster. The second stage of ingestion distributes and replicates these segments around the historical processes in a cluster. And this is key to how the parallelism in Druid is enabled. The broker process knows where the data is for the specific query that you've given it, and it executes that query work in parallel. So if you're comparing time periods or maybe two different accounts, the partitioning and clustering scheme that you select together with the degree of replication that you have gives Druid the best chance to parallelize and prune its plans. It's worth taking some time to familiarize yourself with segment partitioning, particularly if you will have responsibility for sizing clusters, because parallelism at query time comes from the number of segments. And of course, check out Sergio Farragut's series on partitioning schemes. But parallelism is just part of the story. Parallelizing operations on terribly organized data only goes so far. The data that's processed needs to be an optimized format. Druid columnarizes this data it, to power column-wise statistical analysis, and it also builds secondary indexes. It uses dictionary encoding and bitmap indexing to speed up filtering and sorting operations. And it uses type-aware compression for optimal use of storage. Now we're going to look at columnarization, and we're going to use a sample data set to walk through what it does to the data itself when it's stored in the segments. And we're also going to look at this concept of secondary indexes. So let's look at columnarization and secondary indexes. We're going to see how the segments are organized if I ingested this data. Now, if this was any other database of the past that I grew up with, it would probably have this structure, one row for every transaction, probably stored like that as well. So we've got in our sample data set when the transaction occurred, who was involved, what they did, uh, how that affected my stock levels and how happy they were or unhappy they were after the transaction was completed. Look at this schema. We've got our typical format of schema for Druid. We've got the time column, which is our primary column, and then we have dimensions. So the columns are the attributes of each event that gives us content and context. And we have columns that are also giving us measures associated with each event, the kind of things we want to do maths on. Those dimensions overall are giving us data that we'll use for filtering, for sorting, for doing expressions, to compute aggregates. They're the kind of things that we want to find the top N of or to group by or things that I want to bucket my results by. So when I want to know the average satisfaction figure, if I left it like this, Drew would have to read every single row from left to right. We have to read each row over and over and over again, adding up the satisfaction value and then divide by the number of rows. But we learned almost a decade ago now that it's a very wasteful approach to computing statistics. And it certainly doesn't scale to millions of rows a day, let alone millions of rows a second. 
And that's because the system is reading a whole load of data into memory that's inconsequential to the question that we've asked the database. So learning from best practices, Druid columnarizes the data inside each segment, and it makes all the satisfaction values local to the question that we're asking. So now when I ask what's the average satisfaction figure, Druid only reads the data that it needs to. Columnarization also makes it possible to have many more columns in it. So we can have high dimensionality data because all the columns are stored and analyzed separately. But Druid isn't just using columnarization to store data. It goes beyond columnar databases and databases born out of columnarization because remember, Druid has partitioned this data into time periods and it can also subpartition it as well. That's critical to understanding how Druid parallelizes all its operations. So that's columnarization. What about this secondary indexing thing? Well, let's talk about these other well-trodden computer science techniques that Druid is using to make our queries even faster. Dictionary encoding creates codices from the values in the data. And that means that it can avoid reading entire columns when it doesn't need to. Instead, it uses these very small representations of what's in the column. They're very, very small, very fast to read, and much smaller than the original column, in fact. So watch the who and what columns in our sample data here. What we've done, we've got this codex where Peter has been turned into one, Paula into two, Ahmed into three. And notice the column themselves. They have a dramatic size reduction as well because now we're storing integers instead of the actual values. That makes it easier to compress as well. It also stores information about the coverage of the values within the data. And that's really helpful when Druid needs to do its materialization right at the end of the query execution. It also adds a bitmap that it can use for very fast binary operations like OR or AND and NOT. Druid operates then on these compressed versions of the raw data whenever it can. It avoids using the raw data because that's slow and it's memory hungry and Druid is all about leanness and speed. So that's some of Druid optimizations. Go and have a look at the documentation about how Druid does secondary indexing on string columns and of course familiarize yourself with the concept of columnarization. But there's also a couple of things that we can do to optimize our segments. One technique is to do a group by at ingestion time. So here, what we're asking Druid to do is to create and store the aggregates that we'd usually do at query time at ingestion time. In Druid speak, we call these metrics. And as a group by operation usually reduces row counts, Doing something like this helps us to reduce the storage requirement for our data even further and the time it takes for each parallel query task to execute. The considerations for this approach are the same as with all group by operations. If we want to make this work efficiently, you have to think about minimizing the cardinality. You have to think about removing dimensions you don't need. Also give us the lowest row count possible, but giving us also useful data at the end of the day. So let's start with dimensionality straight away on our timestamp column. Now, what I've done here is I floored my time string to 10 minutes. That's reduced the cardinality. Uh, in Druid specifications, you'd use the query granularity setting. Uh, when you use insert with MSQ, you simply use a time truncation function on your time column. Here again, I've set it to 10 minutes. Now, let's talk about the who column. And let's imagine the users for our application here. We go to them and say, oh, do you really need the who column? And they say, actually, yes, we do. Because what we want to do is to count the number of people inside our data that arrived during this particular time period. OK, fine. We'll leave that where it is. Then we ask them about the what column. So what did they do? And they say, oh, well, actually, I want to be able to group by this and maybe filter by particular things. So, OK, we'll leave that as it is as well. And then we go ahead, use our select statement to give us our aggregates at the end here. I've created some stock change and max satisfaction. With inserting uh, MSQ, it's easy. I'm just basically using my usual aggregates, count sum, max, etc. cetera. Um, in uh, JSON-based ingestion specifications, you update your metrics spec. So what we have at the end here is a series of rows broken down into 10-minute chunks 
and I've got my aggregates at the end of it. Now, don't take a look at this doc on roll-up and group buy and how to use it and how to apply it, whether you're using the insert technique in Druid or you're using the JSON ingestion specifications. And I want to drill a little bit here into exactly what happened. There's data in Druid for each who and each what within each when, within each time period. So if we look at 1230, we've actually got two rows being emitted here. We've got one row, which is a who of one and a what of one. And we've got our two aggregates for that. We've got a sum stock change of five and a max satisfaction of five. Then we've got a second row, which is 1230, a who of two, a what of one, some stock change of 17 and a max satisfaction of four. Awesome, we've been really clever. Let's pat ourselves on the back. We've made the resulting data table in Druid more focused. We've also made it shorter. So it's much less data for our hardware to have to churn through to get these figures. And we no longer have to compute the sum or the max at query time. We're just gonna look straight here, wherever it is, just look straight here and get these values straight out of Druid. Awesome, but that's just one way of using Rollup. The other way to use this roll-up technique is essential when you get to massive volumes of data or where you have high cardinality, as we do here. Notice that in the bottom half of our sample table here, the combination of who and what together means there are a lot of rows emitted. We have a column of data here in particular, the who column, that is higher cardinality. And even though our users have said they need to do counts of, say, visitors to their website or IP addresses on their network, is there something we can do about that? Well, put yourselves in the position of the original development team and the project team that surrounds Apache Druid. Druid is a parallel powerhouse because with segment distribution, replication and partitioning schemes, we get awesome parallelism. Here at the lowest level of detail though, we do need each segment to be processed as quickly as it can be given what users are asking for. So when the community thought about this segment level processing optimization very early in Druid's development, they applied another essential technique in computer science, approximation. Now you can hear a lot more about approximation in Druid and how important it is to look at in this video on the Implied Data YouTube channel. Let's work through an example, looking here at the who column. Remember, our end users wanted to count distinct this. Well, there is an approximation technique here that we can use. Instead of storing the raw data, we're gonna store a representation of that within each row. It's called hyperloglog. And what we store is a sketch called a hyperloglog sketch inside each time period. At query time, we have to do things slightly differently. When we want to find the count, we're going to address this new metric column using a special SQL function. It's gonna scan the data and give us a figure back within a predictable error bound. It's techniques like this that we have to be really, really cognizant of. We need to reduce our segment sizes, make them optimal, so that they are read quickly and stored efficiently. It's not just about speed, of course. We also have to think about money. Go and take a look at this page in the docs to get an even better understanding of the importance of segment optimization, about everything I've spoken about today, the kind of things that really supercharge the parallelism in Druid. Thank you for spending time watching this talk. I really only covered just two of Druid's automatic uh, optimization techniques, columnarization and secondary indexing, and then a couple of techniques that you can apply like group by or roll up at ingestion time and the use of data sketches. But if you've got any questions about what you've seen today, you wanna to dig into any of these topics, remember, register on any of the Apache Projects community channels. Say hello to us, we'll say hello to you. You can visit learn.imply.io for more Druid related courses. And you can go to imply.io forward slash newsletter sign up to register for Imply's community newsletter. And of course, please do say thank you to the developers behind Apache Druid. If you're using this database, put a star on that Apache Druid GitHub repo. Thanks.